progress. Here we go. Episode 11 of the Hibs Ramble. Again, for the third week, uh, the third pod in a row, I'm joined by... Oh, that's Siri talking to me. That's that new update. That's my phone talking to me. That's um, my phone fucked the intro. Well, we've got off to a good start here, Sean, eh? <laughs> How are you doing, mate? Yeah, I'm good, mate. I'm good. Thanks for having me again. No, oh, it's... Uh, it's nice to have you. Craig is on his way back from holiday this week, so you can probably expect to hear from him in pods to come. I'm not too sure if he's going to come on for our Ross County preview this week because he's got um, he's got a big job interview that he's preparing for. So we wish him all the best of luck with that. But um, yeah, let's let's just jump straight into the Aberdeen game, Sean. Um, we had a wee chat about the lineup the last time we spoke. Um, you said that Kukarevic, which is the correct way to say it, by the way, according to Hibs, you said that Kukarevic would be nowhere near the start in 11. Were you surprised when you saw the lineup? I was very surprised. Um, I think because he's a bit of an un- or to us anyway, he's a bit of an unknown. So I just didn't expect him to be thrown in the deep end. Um, I expected him to maybe obviously be on the bench, but because he had only arrived in the country so close to the game, I thought, surely not. But, I mean, I thought before the game, if he's getting thrown in, he must be good enough and obviously put on a good show. So, fair play to him. Yeah, I thought that too. Um, looking at the lineup, we actually only made one change from the side that beat Kelly, and that was Henderson out, Kukarevic. And in terms of the personnel that we had available at the time, I thought that it was probably our strongest lineup. Did you agree? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Well, it wasn't until I saw the lineup and then I saw the bench that I thought, oh well, I can kind of understand why we why we're going the way that we're going and why Kukarevic ended up starting. So especially against Aberdeen and their centre half. So yeah, I think that um, we'll get on it a, a little bit later about his style of playing stuff. But I feel that it's it's maybe something that we've been missing. But then. He, we will we will come back and touch on um touch on how he played. But um yeah, so the, the lineup was Marshall and Goal, Cadden, Hanlon, Porches, Chabby at the back, Newell and Kenna holding with Campbell ahead of them with um Boyle, Kukarevich and Yuan making up the front three. Which like I say is it was the for me the strongest lineup that we could have had. There's a lot of pace, a lot of width there that we didn't really have last season, um, which which is good, obviously. But it was a slow start from him, Sean. Very, very. I think I you'd messaged me happy through the game as well. Um, and we, we seem to be at two different ends of the, the scale. As to how <laughs> we thought the first half of the first half was going on. Um, I just thought that we were so, so poor. Um, not in regards to like we just like we're getting dominated by Aberdeen because we weren't. We were still yeah. dominating them, and yet we were still being so poor. So we were like very slack on the ball, which was very disappointing to see, and that was concerning me. We obviously conceded the goal. I thought it was a very well taken goal, a uh, poor goal to concede, but from their point of view, very well taken. Um, and then we just kind of lifted it, and as the game got grew on, we got stronger as as it went on as well. So, but. I feel we were very, very slack in our passes. Couldn't have string a couple of passes together to start with. Um, but thankfully, we obviously came into it as the game, game went on. Yeah, I've got down here, Aberdeen goal, was it well worked or poor defending? I think it's a little bit of both. It was a nice little throw-in routine. And, um, you know, I was listening to it down the slope earlier and, and they reckoned that it was a really nicely worked goal from Aberdeen. The only thought that they would have that they thought Hibs could have done better is stop the cross but I think they moved it about so quickly there and um, it was a, it was a really really good header I think from Duke yeah have, I think it if, was, if it was if it was on the other foot and it was a Hibs goal we'd, we'd be creaming ourselves at how how well it's he's taken it do you know what I mean and to beat a, a keeper like David Marshall and it just looped over him um, Marshall just didn't stand a chance it was really good really good goal so if you take away what we could have done better and, and actually analyse the goal side of it, I think, um, from an Aberdeen perspective, they sh- would have been would have been at the time very happy with 
with that. Kind of a good team they play as well. Yeah. I thought so as well. I thought we started brightly. Like, not brightly, but we started better than they did. But I still didn't think that we were... I mean, you're talking about the first five minutes here. I mean, it's, it takes a maybe sometimes it takes a few minutes to to wake up, and obviously they, they score a they score a good goal, and like you said, it is against it on the play, and that the finish actually reminded me of Cummins at Tynecastle yeah. in the three yeah. two game. I don't think, uh, like I, I don't think Marshall's seen him because he's is that wee, yeah, and he was hiding it's behind just, that. Just that it's came out yeah, it was it was a really really good finish. Whether he's meant it or not is a is a another another. Well, Thank you. Talk about no, the... Nowhere else to go. He knows there's no one near him anyway. So, um, as a former attacker myself, I would I would say that uh, he meant. Would you have done the same? If I would have been nowhere near that. I would, <laughs> I would, see when I played, I would never ever use my head ever. Aye. Uh, is it yeah. just in case you messed up your beautiful hair? That's it. That's exactly. <laughs> back, back then, I when it was looking a lot better. <laughs> when it was a little bit of a better hairline. Aye, you're, aye, you're right. Aye. Your full backs are now. Uh, no tracky backy for your fullbacks at the moment, eh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I thought after the I thought after the the Aberdeen goal, there was a period of good pressure from Hibs, um, and this is when I messaged you, because I I'd thought that after that we reacted really really well, got ourselves on the front foot, had a couple of chances ourselves. I thought Cadden was making a right good nuisance himself in the right hand side, um, and yeah, and, and I think Yuan had a good chance as well. Yuan forced the goal into a really good save. Joe yeah. Newell had a couple of chances. Obviously, um, thinking about what he said post Kelly, thinking that he should shoot a little bit more. But <laughs> if you're going to shoot, then get it on target. I know. Uh... <laughs> I felt um I felt bad for Yuan as well because I feel like he's been coming on game by game and I just think on Saturday there I just feel like he was really really poor um I feel like and maybe that epitomises why we were so poor at starting the match I feel like especially when we went one 0 down I feel like we were trying to force a lot of, a lot of it um which were causing us to make mistakes and maybe decisions that we wouldn't normally make um and I feel like yeah. that's that's part of that was part of the problem I think. I just think Yuan didn't get an. He's been given an awful lot by other defenders this season, but I think Aberdeen maybe did their homework a little bit on him and sussed yeah. him out. Realised that he takes a little bit longer on the ball than you know a Martin Boyle would or or someone else would. He does so dwell on it quite a bit, but when he's when he's not being direct, he does dwell quite a bit on the ball. I feel. Yeah, I think so, but I mean it's something that. I'm sure Lee Johnson will be able to talk to him about it because there's times where it actually it works. Like the goal against Hearts, the goal against Rangers. It works when they held on to it for a wee bit longer. Yeah. But um, and You'd rather someone out, out wide left than a Henderson or a Campbell. You'd rather those type of players were in the middle of the park instead of out wide. So at least, even if he is dwelling on it, he's got the pace to get by someone. So Yeah. Although, I mean, I don't think it was his best game yeah. for Hibs. Not but... That. His work rate again was through the roof, 110. Yeah. percent He must have been blown at his arse when the full time whistle went, and it's been testament to him. Every game that I've seen him this season, he's worked his arse off, and he's burst his cell up and down that line, recovering the ball in the far corner, in our corner. You know, he's for me. I think he's a really, really hard worker and someone that. We we've really been needing that kind of work rate to match Boyles on the yeah. opposite side, and that's why the the two of them swapped quite a bit as well throughout the game, um, and I feel like that troubled the, the Aberdeen defence as well. Um, they kept switching from a four to a five, and then obviously when the sending off came, they they had to stick to a, to a four. So yeah, so we'll move on to um, Liam Scales first yellow card, needless challenge really in the middle of the park. Yeah. I think Josh yeah. Campbell. Is it Josh Campbell that jinks away from him? I can't remember ball? who it is, but there, there is, as a defender, there's no need for him to to come through as, as as hard as he did. There's no need for the challenge. Especially um, in that area of the pitch. Yeah. I feel yeah, all like... All he needs to do is just hold up, show him back, and force the ball back, and then as a defender, he can shuffle back and get back into shape. So Yeah, yeah it's, it seemed like a bit of a silly place. And then, 
obviously, just a matter of moments later, Joe Newell swings in the cross, Ryan Porches gets Liam Scales in a headlock and then pulls Liam Scales to the ground, but Liam Scales gets a second yellow and a red card and we get a penalty. I feel like there's a little bit more to that that you're maybe leaving <laughs> out uh, for those that have not seen the game. Um, but yeah, I think it's... Is it clever? Yes, it is. Uh, does the referee fall for it? I, I wouldn't maybe go as far as that because it doesn't matter if it's Ryan Porteous that, that gets brought down regardless of, of the of the Hibs player. It's a, it's a penalty. Do you know yeah, what I mean? I, think, I, know, I know Ryan initiates the contact. I get that. That's that's where the smart bit comes into it from him. But um, it's a it's it's a foul. Doesn't matter where it is in the park. That's a foul. It's in the box, so therefore it's a penalty. And unfortunately for Aberdeen and Liam Scales, it, it was a second jail, and he had to go. Aye, but he had we're, to go, Liam. <laughs> we're saying that Ryan Poachers initiates a contact, but Liam Scales gets so close to him yeah. before the corner's even taken. Ryan Poachers is attacking the ball. And how on earth, for the ball. How on earth is Ryan Poachers not meant to make contact with Liam Scales? I get that the, oh, I, the, the initiating contact part, but I feel that Liam Scales did more to Ryan Poachers than Ryan Poachers yeah, did to Scales. I, I agree, and I think as a from a man-marking perspective at a corner, you're going to, both attacking and defense, uh, defensively, you're, you're going to get close to your man. Do you know what I mean? So he's going to have Ryan's going to have to try and get rid of his man at some point, whether that's pushing him out of the way or giving him a pull to yank him back. Uh, that's natural. That, that happens. So um, it's just unfortunate for Aberdeen that what happens after it is that he gets brought down. Do you know what I mean? If if Ryan had just pulled on him or pushed him out of the way and then attacked the ball and Liam Scales doesn't get involved, then would have Ryan probably got to the ball? I, I don't know because I, I don't know the trajectory of the ball and where Ryan was going to end up. But um, I do feel that if... I if think Liam, the ball was going right over them, eh? I, I, th- I think if Liam Scales hadn't got involved after Ryan goes for the tug, I don't think the penalty gets given. But because Liam gets involved in it, um, that then it then becomes a coming together. And as soon as it's a coming together, Ryan just needs to leave his legs and, and, and there's a collision and then that's it. Game over. Yeah. Well, it was our first penalty since Jack Cross's last game against Tovington in December. But oh, you well, can that one, yeah. Yeah, you can probably count, you know, on two or three hands, depending on how many fingers you've got, the amount of times that um, we've had incidents like that at corners, at free kicks, where someone's been brought down and the referee has just waved it on. And, and not given it, so I think that it's 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 been coming. I think it's very um, it's, it's very very hard for a referee to make make the call because there is a lot of factors in there. Is he watching the ball? Is he watching the men around the goalkeeper? He's got about ten bodies to watch in in the box as well. So as a referee, you're probably just looking for your normal culprits, which in this instance would be Ryan Portress, the ones that are actually going to be trying to head the ball. So. Um, and I think that's probably why he's got his eye, eyes on him as well as obviously Mr Goodwin stating to the referee that Ryan does cheat so that's maybe another reason why he had his eyes on him but yeah we'll definitely talk about that later on Yeah and um, I mean it's a, it's, a, it's a penalty all day long for me in real time the referee sees it Scales Porches goes down first and Scales lands on top of him Yeah but, I mean how can Scales not be forcing him over there but Penalty. Very Martin well. Boyle steps up. Yeah. Um, were you ever in doubt? Uh, yes. <laughs> were you really? Yes. Um, I always have... And I've got no level of foundation for this, but I'm always uneasy with Martin Boyle hitting penalties. Um, it goes back to... It goes back to... United. Away, um, when he took it off Grant Hall and... It was Grant, I think it was Grant Holt. It was Grant yeah, Holt. Sure I tell, I tell you why. I tell you why that happened because see on the on the on the the Scottish Cup DVD that we brought yeah. out, and he was talking about his penalty in the semi final in the shootout. Which is a really good penalty. And he said that he changed his mind in the run up, and I knew when he picked that ball up for Grant Holt against Dundee United uh, the following season. I was like, to my, I said to my dad, I went. 
he's going to change his mind and he's going to miss it. And he did miss it. I had, I, I, there was quite a few of us in there we end at the time for that penalty. And one of my mates had um, Grant Holt to score. So obviously, it was, it was buzzing thinking he was going to take it. Um, and then obviously, Martin Boyle took it and, and missed the penalty. So <laughs> one, of my, one of my other mates as well actually had Martin Boyle to score. Oh, no. So one was raging that Martin Boyle took it off and the other one was buzzing. And then the other one was raging when Martin Boyle missed it. So, um, nah, I just, I, I, I don't, obviously Martin Boyle's went on to become the player he is. I never, ever, ever thought he would become anywhere near the level of player that he is. But I just don't. Always sticks in the back of your mind, does it? Yeah. Um, and he, I think I, I put a, at the beginning of, was it the beginning of last season? Or the season before, we were winning loads of penalties, um, and Martin Boyle was scoring them all. Oh, and there was this COVID agenda, season. and there was this agenda that Martin Boyle wins us penalties, and that he's the, he's the diver. That was the agenda at that point. So I'd done a wee bit of research, and I think we had won like eleven penalties, and Martin Boyle had only won one of them. Um, but he'd went on to score all the penalties. So I don't actually have any lively foundation for thinking that he's going to miss. But when any player is about to take a penalty and there's a whole lot of hassle before the penalty. There's loads of fat around. Yeah, People stand on the too long. That always concerns me and that's why I thought he was he was going to miss it. I think what has improved greatly, apart from his football and ability, over the time that he's been at Hibs is his composure. It's like nothing phases him now. Yeah. Um, which is ideal for us because as soon as he steps up to take a penalty, I think that he's going to score it every single time because he's he's just so good and he he, he changes it all the time. He eh? goes high, goes low, goes right down the middle, goes left and right. But penalty aside, brilliant penalty, celebration though. Uh, over the, to the nice, Aberdeen nice, fans. Nice, nice, Get that up them, by the way, because they were shouting and going, way every time he was fouled or did a bad pass or whatever. So they deserved that. They really did. They seem very entitled that uh, bunch from up north. They seem entitled. So for it's someone different. for someone who's never played for them or never played for any of their rivals, they seem to hate them an awful lot. And I, I, can, I mean, I Kenny's an Aberdeen born and bred. I don't want to say he's an Aberdeen fan because of... I think maybe that's too far to say now. I think maybe when he first joined Hibs, he would have had a soft spot for Aberdeen, but I don't think that's the case now. Do you know what I mean? That's a different different kettle of fish when you're actually a a footballer, do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So, half-time whistle goes, 1-1. One, one. Where are you thinking, second half, Aberdeen down to 10 men, This that we'll go on and beat them then? Yeah, 100%. I didn't actually, I didn't actually think that um, Aberdeen stood a chance after it went down to 10 men because of how well we had grown into the game. I think we got very, very strong as the game went on. Before the penalty, it, it was just a matter of time until we scored and then obviously we got the penalty it was just a, a matter of time of how quickly can we get the second one I was slightly concerned if, if it goes on too long um, then it might become a bit of a fighting match and then we might lose uh, and, and they might be able to nick one but um, nah, I, I was very confident that we were going to score so um, it was just a case of making sure that we didn't then get caught in the break or anything like that and I, I'm glad obviously we got I don't want to see the goal early, but we got got the second goal early enough into the second. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, we came out of the traps flying. We had a a lot of really good opportunities. Um, I'm just trying to figure out when we actually scored the goal. Uh, sixty-two minutes. Sixty-two. Yeah. So uh, I'm just getting it off. Sixty-two and seventy-three. That's right. So we we did have a lot of pressure before the goal. I know there was a chance that. You know, one of three players probably could have scored. I think it was Joe Newell. I think Campbell was in there as well. Really good double save by Kel Roos, who I thought was was good, despite yeah. chucking the ball into his net three times. Uh, <laughs> um, there was one where Josh Campbell bore down on goal, could have cut it back to Kukarevic, uh, and didn't, decided to go to his cell. I feel like on another day, and this has been the case for like the last five or six weeks. It could have been 
you know, a, I thought, a lot I thought more. That, that it could have been one of those games. I know you mentioned it in the Aberdeen preview that it's a matter of time until we give somebody a do in. I know you didn't think it was going to be on Saturday there, but I do think it certainly could have been um, because of the way Aberdeen were playing. I think uh, Lee Johnson certainly gave them a foot up the backside at half time because yeah. of how poor we were and, uh, and how poor some of our passing was at the beginning of the first half. So I think he was just wanting to maybe settle the nerves a wee bit by getting you know, that second goal. Um, I mean, predictably, Aberdeen sat in as deep as they could until they scored, until we until we got that second goal. And then after they got the second goal, they changed their shape completely, which we'll come on to after we talk about the second goal. But yeah, um, it, it was then just a case of it was a very, very wide and open game, which was always going to suit us. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we'll talk about the goal now. Um, and I feel like it was it was superb from Chris Cadden. Picks the ball up really deep, drives forward, um, and then it's, that's a pinpoint pass to Josh yep. Campbell. But there's got to be a lot of credit to Kukarevic because he drags to the defenders to make the space for Campbell. And uh, Cadden slips it right in, in between, in the gap. Lovely touch to control it, keeps it close to his feet, and then... Just, just licks it past the goalie. I think the goalie maybe could have done a slight bit better. It's quite close to him. Uh, I think maybe because of the goal, the goalkeeper's position when the knockdown comes after the ball comes in, I think maybe that's what throws him off. Um, and then from where Josh hits it, I think it's just a matter of like, you're you're not you're just not going to save it. Do you know what I mean? You're just going to put your foot through one of those as well and just yeah. make, make sure it hits the back of the net. It's a great finish. It really was. Uh, I was delighted for Josh Campbell, and that made him the joint top scorer for us for 10 minutes before he scored again. Uh, again, really good work from Cadden. Uh, it's worked out to the right hand side. He swings it in. Kukarevich nods it down. And brilliant brilliant nod down as well. Brilliant nod down. The fox in the box, quickest to react, and pokes it home. I mean, that's a striker's instinct. Very Frank Lampard esque that that finish I felt arriving late for the third for the third goal. So really, well, really good. Not that finish. Campbell is anywhere near Frank Lampard's level, but he's uh, certainly Frank close, Lampard's got he's closer to the dance level maybe. maybe <laughs> but no, so that's um, a, a really really good goal again, and again good work from Kukarevic, even yeah. though he wasn't you know directly involved in you know, getting an assist or a secondary assist for the first goal. He got his assist for the second one, but his work was was really, really good. Um, we'll come on to Josh Campbell in a second. We'll talk about Kukarevic now. Is a big target man like Kukarevic what we need for Chris Cadden's crosses? I think every club needs that kind of option. Whether, whether the target man is... Five foot eleven, which Josh Doig, not Josh Doig, uh, Christian Doig was. Um, I feel like a lot of people forget that Christian Doig isn't actually that tall, but he gets used as a as a target man. Whether it's somebody that height or you've got somebody like Kukarevic who are you know considerably taller. What's that? Is he six four or something like that? Something like that. Um, so I think if every club needs that kind of option, they need a a big, bulky, physical striker. Um, you're never you're never going to be able to um, win every game playing the old Barcelona way or or even the way that Celtic are trying to play now. You're you're yeah. never going to win every game as you can see because obviously Celtic drop points at the weekend, so we're uh, closing in on on first spot again, which is good <laughs> to see. Um, but no, it's it's a good option to it's a good option to have, and I think he impressed a lot of people as well on. On Saturday, surprisingly, and, and I was one of those. Yeah, no, I think I think me and Craig said that when he came in that he, he'll end up giving us a different dimension up front. With a lot of our attackers are wee nippy, quick, um, good on the ball. It's just a not, case of is he is he any good? Do you know what I mean? And I think he is. I, well, yeah. if he's anything like how he was on Saturday, then then I think we will, you know, it'll be a he'll, he'll have a good time here. Yeah. Um, aye, so back to Josh Campbell. Four goals now. 
Um, top scorer for Hibs, a Scotland cap can't be far away. <laughs> Talking of Scotland caps, by the way, I do not understand how Liam Henderson's not in that squad. Yeah. Because if you're picking people like Kenny McLean, I know we're getting off topic, but Scotland caps and all. Um, if you're picking people like Kenny McLean and a half fit Ryan Jack, and then you've got Liam Henderson, who's who's only, bossing not, out of he's only not played in one of the last thirty odd games or something ridiculous like that. I seen at the weekend. Yeah. So it's like thirty three out of thirty four games uh, that he's played. And I think the thirty four was the one at the weekend. So, yeah. um, aye, but yeah, uh, Josh Campbell, nah, probably not. Too good, too good for Scotland. I half, I half fit Scotland. Ryan Jack though, and I know that there. I mean, you look at the players that we've got, and that this is, this feels mental to say it, but eh, but if he keeps up this form, then Steve Clark can he ignore him? He, he can't. I think we're very we're very lucky with the, the amount of midfielders we've got, whether it's a six, an eight, or a ten. And unfortunately, Steve Clark, it doesn't matter who we're talking about, um, Scotland-wise, who does and doesn't deserve a call-up. Scotland, at the moment, have a group of players that are the core of that squad, and Steve Clark trusts them. Very similar to, like, England. Yeah. and Harry Maguire Harry Maguire does it every international for England but can he can he string a pass together for Man United and can he get in the team and rightly so because sure, yeah. he's, he's a donkey but it, 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 that's what it reminds me of it reminds me of England and their squad selection how oh, what is it a 23 man squad and maybe 15 to 18 of that is the exact same players regardless how they're playing I think Scotland are getting down that route as well where Steve Clark's picking a lot of I think the he's same favourites I feel but I, I, don't, I don't know if it's maybe favourites I think it's more of who he, who he trusts and who he doesn't trust and I think that's why it's taken so long for Ryan Pochers to even get a call up again I know he's been in four squads He's been in four, four or five squads across Never the capped, four, right. four years, 2018, 19, 20, and so on, and not been capped. And unless we're winning in either of the, the games that, we're, that we play in this international break, I can't see Ryan getting a game either, unfortunately. Which is a shame, because I think he deserves it. Yeah, I think, I think it, if, if we're winning and we're, we're trying to secure a lead, I think he'll maybe come on and... I think he stands more of a chance because we play a back three and he's good in a back three as well. Yeah. So, but I don't think that we'll actually win any of the the games against Ukraine anyway. I don't think we'll beat Ukraine. So, um, not if Kukarevich is playing. <laughs> um, so I don't. I, I can't see him unfortunately getting that cap again. I hope I'm wrong, like I was last week with Kukarevich not getting this in the start. <laughs> of and I hope I'm wrong with Ryan Portis as well. I'll continue that theme happily. Yeah, but um. Aye, I, I think if see if we if we were still playing international friendlies, and like the meaningless games, do you think then if if say the the international break wasn't it this weekend but it was next weekend and Steve Clark had to choose his squad this week, do you think with the start of the season George Campbell's had, Janky would be, <laughs> do, do you know Hanky would even be in the conversation? Do you know you think that? Steve Clark would have a look at that and say, "Listen, four goals from midfield. You know, he's he's How old playing is he? really well. How old is he? Twenty-one. I think he's twenty. He's maybe twenty-two, twenty-three. Twenty-two. Let me just check now. I'll let you ramble about how good he is and how he's going to be Scotland's record goal scorer. Yeah, I think he will be, and he'll definitely be a Hibs top goal scorer this season. Twenty-two. He turned, 20, he turned twenty-two this year. Um, but he he's only just been capped for Scotland twenty-ones. This year, yeah. so um, that will stand him in good stead because if he's only just been given that under twenty one cap this year, um, I know obviously he's twenty two now, so that's not going to make any difference. But he's on he's on the radar as, as you'd like to put it. But nah, unfortunately for me, there's a uh, he ain't getting that call up unless he turns <laughs> into unless he turns into peak John McGinn, he ain't getting that call up. Come on, Sean. You're meant to be agreeing with my um, Josh Campbell agenda here. Well, what's what, what's the point? There's no debate in that. 
if 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 Josh Campbell gets in the Scotland squad ahead of Liam Henderson, I will be gobsmacked. Will you get a tattoo of Josh Campbell if it happens? I absolutely will not. <laughs> because <laughs> because you know it's going to happen. Because, because I don't think Steve Clark rates Liam Henderson either, and that's the problem. Yeah. No, that's a shame. But yeah, like you say, we are on a big a big fat tangent here, eh? <laughs> but uh, I let's get back to after we scored the third goal. And the only point of note that I can remember or that I really want to remember was when uh, the boy Richardson shot up the right-hand side and it looked <laughs> like it was going to be 3-2. Uh, he squared it across for Majovski. And I'm, I'm not being funny, but I, I genuinely do not know how he has missed it with the physics and how he hit it. How he's, he ran, it? He's, ran, he's ran too far. He's, he's thought the ball was going to get played further ahead. It's been cut back ever so slightly. There's no deflection, nothing like that. There is no excuse for him to miss it. Um, is it worse than Big Mamadou Bojang's miss the other week? Absolutely. This one oh, is a lot worse. Um, Bojang had a goalie to beat. Yeah, and he had uh, the length of the pitch to think about it. I think for... Is it Majovic? Majovski. 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 Big Bojan, Aberdeen's Bojan Majowski. Um <laughs> Aberdeen fans can come at me if they want. Um, I just, I, I don't know. I, I've, I've been in, I've been in that position a few times, where you have to kind of get your body back, and then get your foot around it, and kind of scoop it at the same time. I think that's what he's tried to do. He's anticipated it being further ahead, but yeah, it's an absolute stinker. Uh, I mean, they wouldn't have went. They wouldn't have went on and got a third anyway, because they were, were far too open. They, I don't know if you noticed, but as soon as we scored, well, before we scored the second, and it, it, this changed again when we scored the third. They they only had two two defenders at the back. Yeah. Two oh, centre. They had two two defenders, two centre halves, two centre midfielders, and then everyone else was up front. Um, they just left themselves so open after the second goal, and I understand why. That's obviously how we managed to get the third goal because they, because we managed to exploit the spaces a bit more as well. So, um, strange tactical decision from Goodwin there to go two centre halves and everyone else up front. But um, I think, I think he, he was just trying to. He, I mean, if he didn't go for it, then there's what's the point, eh? Yeah. I respect that from Goodwin, but what I don't respect from Goodwin was his post-match comments. So full time came and went three one Hibs, fantastic result, really good three points. Like we spoke about last time, Sean, we, it was it, I think it sets a good bar and a, a good barometer of where we're at. Um, I feel like if you beat Hibs, beat Aberdeen, it shows you that you know we're probably going to kick on and have a half decent season. If we get beat in that game, then you know it's maybe time to. We should, have, we should have also had another penalty as well. Don't forget. We about should have. It. We actually should have had two penalties. Three, three. three penalties. Three. You got the hand. You got the handball, which is a handball. The handball uh, in the second half. In the no, and then the handball in the second half with, with Bojang. Yeah. And I'm sure there was another penalty shot before the Bojang one. So there was three blatant ones that I remember. So the one that we got. So the first one, which was Porteous and McCrory, McCrory handball, because he's there, his hands. He's waving at something in, in the in the cheap seats. So um, that's a penalty. The one that we got was a penalty, and the one right at the end of the game, Bojang, the Bojang where he, um, he, he like cuddled the ball basically, didn't uh, he? Yeah. Fam. I think if if we hadn't already been given a penalty, that would have been given. Yeah, I think so. I think so. But so, I. Goodwin's got absolutely nothing to stand he, on. He, he really but. doesn't have anything to, anything to stand on. But his comments, I didn't agree with. I listened to his post-match interview to um, Brian McLaughlin in the car. And is, is he a bad loser? Yes. Or does he have a point? There's no points to be had. Bad loser. I'm, so, I'm so glad that you said that. because I really Better a white-haired old man. It was um, his comments saying that. It, did you did you hear his interview on the radio? On I watched uh, the I watched his interview um, with Don's TV. 
So what he said to BBC, he went, he kind of thought about what he wanted to say about Ryan Portichus, and then he went, he's a, uh, he's a, uh, he, he cons the referee, and he thought about it, and he thought about it, and then he just went on to call Ryan Portichus a, a cheater. He needs to, he needs to make he, his mind up because he's now calling him a cheater, and he's saying he's he's, he's conning referees, but. A year ago, when it happened against his St Mirren side, he said that Ryan Poaches is a clever player and it's not Ryan's fault that the referee is buying into it. So he's clearly, it's a bitter pill for him to swallow and he's clearly unhappy that it's happened both times he's came to Easter Road. So. I mean, I think uh, Ryan Poaches is someone that opposition love to hate. Uh, I think we're really lucky to have him. He's a really good player. But he's 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 taken his. I mean, I I don't think he's actually been that great this season. I think he has been error prone. I think he's. Yeah. I think that might also be because Lee Johnson's asking him to play a bit more aggressive, not in regards to his tackling, but in regards to his passing. Yeah. Because he does have that ability to scoop a ball over and and, and find the man. So, um, I'm I'm not for one second thinking that Lee Johnson's asking him to be more physically aggressive because he doesn't need to be. That's in his nature anyway, but yep. his ability of passing and going forward, I think that's maybe what's led to him not being as good because he's too busy trying to find these these passes uh, that he's clearly being asked to make. Um, but he's got that in his locker, so we, sh- we should try and nurture that. And you know, For sure. Better. For sure, but just going back to what Goodwin was saying, and like how you said that he, he said that he was clever before, so as being clever and kind of doing what Ryan Poachers does, is it cheating? No, I think cheating would cheating's diving. Yeah. There's no there's no contact. You're going down. You're you're trying to con the referee. There's a difference between initiating contact and then making there be contact, which is what Ryan's doing, and diving. If he was diving, then then he's cheating. Yeah, I think we would we would sit here and say that though, because he did it against Livingston. We weren't happy about that. Yeah, he, he threw his cell on the floor, but he, the I, thing is, he, he 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 does that though, but there's at least contact to do it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So he does it all the time. It, 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 it would annoy me as an opposition fan, and I can completely understand why. He's a pantomime villain, and I think it's great. I think it's brilliant. Scottish football needs them. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Scott Brown, whether it's Morelos, whether it's Martin Boyle when he was a diver, or whether it's now <laughs> you know, uh, Ryan Porteous. But he does it a lot where he'll slow himself down. He'll get contact in the back of him. I'm not talking about trying to win penalties. I'm just talking in general play. And he'll yeah. just bang a foul. It's just, it's just smart, it's smart play. You see That's Sergio Ramos player. do it all the time. You see top centre half do it all the time. If you're a top centre half and you're worth any any anything, then you're able to buy fouls when your team needs it. And Completely that's agree. at the moment what Ryan's been bringing into his game. He does make it a little bit blatantly obvious that it's a soft touch, and he, he does over exaggerate it sometimes when he falls to the ground. But, but what what player does he these days? I know I'm not I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying he does. He is very smart in the way where he tries to read when he needs to buy a foul and when he doesn't. And 99 times out of 100, the, the referees blow the whistle, and that's because it is a foul. If you came, if I slowed down and you came barging into the back of me, I'm going to fall over, and therefore it's technically to the laws of the game, it's a foul. Yeah. No, I completely agree. So Same bus for when it's in a box. And enough about that horrible bastard Jim Goodwin. Because I really didn't have any time for him at all. Didn't like him as a player. Didn't like him as a manager. Don't like him as a man. Think he would be rubbish on a night out. Uh, you know, he'd probably be really creepy to, to bird play, wouldn't he? He would be. He gives. He gives you that. He'd be really creepy to young lads. He'd be one of those that would be hanging around. Um... Takeaway shops on the way home, kebab shops. I know, I know we're ringing kebab <laughs> shops into that again this week. We had post the glue. He'd be, <laughs> uh, he'd be lingering about the chippies and that afterwards, and and chatting to anyone that's spilling everything all over the shop, offering them lifts home in that. 
but a bad man, a bad man. And no, in no way is this an accusation of you, Mr. Goodwin. This is just uh, what we think you would be like on a night out. But we'll wrap up. Prove us wrong. Prove us wrong, good John Goodwin. Come out. John Goodwin? <laughs> uh, <laughs> is that? We'll, uh, we'll wrap this up and avoid being cancelled by going through a few listener questions and thank you to everyone who submitted a question. We really, really appreciate it. Um, obviously, we are still quite a young podcast, so any listens or anyone who interacts with us apart from you know opposition fans, we, we really, really appreciate it. Nah, bring um, them in. Get them in. More exposure, Eric. Yeah, bring them in. Let's go. Well, I actually, I actually tweeted... Um, as long as you're no... Uh, do abusive. I'm I talking tweeted... A, yeah, no, well, I know I'm... I can. No, I, I, sometimes I can't help myself, though. Well, exposure is good exposure, bro. Don't you worry. That's true. No, I, I was ripping into Aberdeen on the Twitter on Saturday. But, uh, yeah, apart from that. No, questions, questions. Tangent again. Come on, Liam. See if Craig was here. He'd have, he'd have wrung my neck for this. This is why he hosts and I'm... And I'm <laughs> I just talk. I just talk shit. Right, okay. First question comes from Billy Sterling. With Jim Goodwin coming out and calling Poachers a cheat, but last season defending Lewis Ferguson for diving and also having a go at Nielsen for criticising his player, is he a massive hypocrite? And is it acceptable? Is it ever acceptable for a manager to call a player a cheat? No. Um, it's not acceptable. I think there's a line that needs to be crossed, especially if you were a former player yourself, um, especially so recently, because he's, he's not actually that old and he was playing not too long ago. And he was a horrible player as well. Aye, aye. So somebody like him just, just needs to wind his neck in a wee bit and maybe be a wee bit smarter with his interviews. Yeah. But uh, do you think he's a massive hypocrite, Sean? Yes. Good. I think that's that's the sound bite that we all want to hear. That's the that's headline. Sean Corrigan thinks Jim Goodwin is a massive white-haired hypocrite <laughs> who tries to pick up drunk lassies outside kebab shops <laughs> with Ange Postacoglu right, right, eating right. off the rotisserie. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that is so true. <laughs> okay. I'll let you decide which is it and which is. <laughs> Callum Laidlaw is asked, um, as an addition to Billy's question, do you think this will influence Ryan Poacher signing a new contract? Given that we have heard that there's been positive talks recently. It runs out in the summer, eh? His deal. Yeah. Yep. I, um, I think he will sign one, but I don't think he'll stay at the club for the duration of that contract. Yeah, a bit like uh, Jason Cummins sort of situation. Yeah. Um, I'd be happy with that because it would mean that we would get a bit of dough for him. As terrible as it is to say, Ryan Poachers does need to move. Um, yeah. I'm, not saying he's outgrown, I'm, not, I'm not saying he's outgrown the club, but I, I'm saying that he's outgrown the, the league. Not because he's too good for the league, but because, because of the agenda that's against him. I don't want him or his career to be hindered by the nonsense that's going on at the moment and someone with his ability would be suited in a better league. Yeah, we'll actually come on to that in a second. Um, the next question is from John McIntosh, a long-time listener. He always submits a question, so we really appreciate that, John. Um, he says, starting 11 for the next game, personally, I'd give Yuan a rest and start McCurdy on the left, and I think I would agree. Maybe too, maybe too early to say, because you're talking... Uh, next Saturday that, that's yeah, I suppose play. so, wait, I'm, I so keep, we've got, we've got the international break we need to have a look at how players cope um, between now and then I think it will be really good that uh, we do have the international break now as well so again we touched on it last week or in the last pod about getting people on the grass uh, and more time spent with the players especially for the manager so um you don't, in my opinion, you don't change a winning formula. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it. I'd keep it as close to the starting eleven that we've played either this game or or the last game. Um, yeah, I'm forgetting that it's a international break as well. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Next question. We've got quite a lot of questions today. We've got two more, and uh, this one comes from Kevin Wilson again. 
someone who always submits a question, so we appreciate that, Kev. Um, and he say, he says more or less the same thing. What would you guys have the forward line looking like next game? Personally, feel apart from Boyle, the other two positions can be heavily rotated, considering the options available. Um, and he also says, who in Scottish football is next to be rattled by the Bash brothers, Porteous and Johnson? Hopefully Ross County. Aye, uh-huh, Ross County. It's, uh, I think, um, I actually think we'll get somebody sent off against Ross County, you know that. Probably. Well, I mean, we need to even it up somehow. So, um, yeah, I think I think the St. Johnson game will be good, but I think... Um, Ross County, come on, Sean. Sorry, what did I say? St. Johnston. St. Johnston. Why did they beat them? Why have I got St. Johnston on my mind? They're all chukters, really, yeah, aren't they? I hate them all. hate them all. Ross County, sorry. Um, nah, I think... I think We'll get somebody sent off against Ross County this time, and then I think Johnson and Porteous will be very vocal about that, and then that'll wind a few people up. Maybe it'll be Porteous that gets sent off. It probably will be Porteous and Johnson getting sent off. But uh, aye, so what would you go for the the front front three? Would you go for just the same as uh, same as I'd, Saturday? I'd, I'd keep it. I'd keep it. I think you, you, again, touching on the last question, you don't want to change, in my opinion, a winning formula. Um, if they're fully fit and they're ready to go, I would go with that. Uh, Ewan Henderson, very, very unlucky to, to not be playing, but realistically... I think Kukarevich is he, deserving I, of keeping his place. Aye, but I think someone like uh, Ewan Henderson needs to be playing in the middle, and at the moment you can't, you cannot drop Josh Campbell. So Undroppable. Yep. Steve Clark, if you're listening, get on the phone to Josh Campbell and do it sooner rather than later. Final question from Haley, and we're ending it on a on a light note. What is it going? What is going to be done about the negative media spout directed Hibs way, blatant lies and defamation? I'm actually quite interested to see. Um, I think it's it's been happens. a total witch hunt from uh, top to bottom. Yeah, from Hibs, think, and it's it's been a disgrace to be honest. Since since the Jack Ross sack and um, and then the whole yeah. Maloney. That I feel like Hibs have been, I don't want to say picked on, but scrutinised a lot more than, than any other club. Is it because we're absolutely massive? Probably. Probably. Um, is it because we're, we're unstoppable and we're going to win the lot, apart from the League Cup? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Is Josh Campbell going to score 20 goals this season? Absolutely. I mean, he's a quarter of the way there. Is Ryan Porteous not going to get sent off all season? That will rattle some more people, absolutely, because he's a genius at how he plays. Um, I don't know, but I like that Hibs are demanding answers. I think think it's a disgrace because we're being... I don't know what to say. Oh, they're slagging us. You know what I mean? I don't know what to sound like a wee wee crybaby, but... Too long we've been easily, easily pushed over, so... The fact that not only are we the most, we're committing the most fouls in the league now and getting away with it clearly because we're tremendous at what we do because we're we're cheating all the time. We're so good at cheating. <laughs> um, I think it's good that Hibs are demanding answers from Abu. Yeah, and a good one for the comments. So long may it continue. I completely agree, and and like you say, it's it's not. It's, it has been since the Jack Ross sacking, and there has been a lot of scrutiny on Hibs, but. I don't think we're now being seen as boy band tibs anymore. I think we're being seen as horrible Maybe cheating too, bastard. But if you take Porteous out of that team, I think we're st- we've still got that bit about us. But I have noticed since Lee Johnson has came in, you are seeing more of our players round the ref and, and berating the ref a wee bit. So, um, Conning the ref. Aye, long may that continue. Quite right. But listen, Sean, that's uh, that's been a quick 49 minutes. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you again, mate. What are you going to do for the rest of the day? Go back to work? Uh, work, um, family stuff tonight, gym tonight. So, yeah, keep myself busy, ticking over. Superb. Well, I couldn't go yesterday because they were big, big Lizzie. So. Yeah, that was a shame. That was a shame. I mean, I was definitely going to go to the gym as well, but I got the notification through my phone saying, gym's closed, and I went, oh, for God's sake, I'll, I'll no go then. <laughs> And then you've got the podcast today, so obviously that just takes it right out of your whole day. Listen, podcast, looking after the bear and everything, so 
it's, it's going to take a back seat for for, nah. uh, for today at least. You know what I mean? I'll <laughs> maybe go and, it's on tomorrow then. I'll, I'll maybe phone up Ange Postacoglu and see if he wants to go eat kebabs with me. I'll not be in unless by the time you get through to Glasgow. <laughs> I can. You'll need to come through here. But perfect. Yeah. Again, thanks so much for coming on, mate. You've been um, you, you've you've done really well in your your first few times being on a podcast and thank you very much i hope you've enjoyed yourself craig's oh, coming back oh, craig's coming back today but we've got the we've got the break so we're, we're going to need to think of something non ross county related to to give to all our lovely listeners so you can you can be involved in that if you like i'd love that that'd be great thank you very much Perfect. Right, okay, I'll wrap up now because we've gone on for far too long. I'm starving. I want my lunch. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. Cheers, bye.